lost. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. How to um, today's panel breakout is really um, how to make electrification more equitable. And I think it'll be a very interesting conversation. Um, I'm going to have or have the panelists introduce themselves and then I'll introduce myself and then we'll come right back to it. And we can go in alphabetical order um, just to make things seamless. So we want to start off with you, Amy, and then go from there and then uh, Neha and then Sahar. Okay, I'll, I'll start off. Um, and just so you know, this has been happening to me since I uh, started school. Um, I always go first because of my Amy Ashley name. So I'm used to that. I'm happy to do it. Um, my name is Amy Ashley, and I am with Austin Energy. Um, I work on the electric vehicles and emerging technologies team. Um, my role there is the uh, senior lead for the EV equity program. Um, I've been with the utility now for a little over four years, um, working to bring social and environmental justice to emerging technologies with a heavy focus around transportation electrification, um, helping to serve um, our uh, marginalized communities and historically underserved uh, communities. So um, these, these uh, conversations um, are wonderful to have. I'm happy to be here today, and I'm I'm really happy to see across the country that this is becoming a focus, and that these conversations are happening at this level. So, thanks for having me. I look forward to it. Neha. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Neha Palmer. I'm the CEO of Terawatt Infrastructure. We're a provider of large-scale charging solutions for fleets and medium and heavy-duty vehicles. Um, we're helping lead the way for at-scale charging infrastructure that is going to be required to transform our transportation systems. Um, we develop our own portfolio of assets into large-scale EV charging stations. We can also finance and own uh, large-scale EV charging infrastructure for others um, who want to electrify but may not be able to make that upfront CapEx um, commitment themselves. So really looking forward to today's discussion. Again, uh, echo what Amy said, this is such an important topic. and. Certainly something we think about as we build our business. Thank you. Um, and good good uh, morning, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a long day already. Um, my name is Sarah Shrazi. I'm a principal and co-lead for our emerging mobility sector with Nelson Nygaard uh, Associates based out of Oakland, California. Um, and I work uh, at the intersection of um, transportation, equity, environment, land use, uh, really focused on people first and creating outcome driven approaches to strategy planning and project implementation. Um, I, I started working in emerging mobility specifically because I see the opportunities that are present and somewhat uh, imminent in terms of enhancing equity and equitable outcomes for the communities that we've served and misserved uh, over the last uh, few decades. Um, so I'm really excited about this conversation. I'm really excited to broaden our thinking around electrification. Uh, I think that there's been, um, as Amy noted, a lot of really great conversations happening uh, locally, nationally, um, and, and at different states. So excited to jump in on this one as well. Great. So really quickly, um, I am Terry Travis, a managing partner of BB Noir. Um, we are an organization that works in two areas, e-mobility, best practice. So we work on multimodal electrification, um, as well as e-mobility, diversity, equity, and inclusion, ensuring that as we think through this cleaner and greener future, that it is diverse and equitable. Um, some of the areas that we work on are beneficial public policy, increased multimodal EV adoption, and access to infrastructure, workforce and economic development, education and outreach, research, data analysis and monitoring, um, medium and heavy duty. Uh, we do a lot of work in the ride share space, um, EV and AV marketing and innovative uh, EV financing. In addition to that, I am also the co-founder of EV Hybrid Noir, which is the nation's largest network of diverse EV drivers and enthusiasts. Really glad to be here today. This conversation is critically important um to the work that we do um and really just personally i think that it's something that um as was stated earlier i'm just glad to see that this is a higher priority topic for folks and 
it's really going to be important that those of us who are steeped in this work really accelerate best practices and, and share with others how they should be approaching this. So with that being said, um, you know, everybody, I want to, you know, all the attendees to the room, just feel free to, to you know, make space and, and, you know, feel comfortable. This is a conversation that can get very, you know, deep and granular, but we want to make sure that everyone has a place and space and, um, you know, looking forward to today's conversation. So with that being said, you know, one of the things that, you know, there's a lot of conversation around EVs. Um, last week, uh, President Biden uh, went to Dearborn and actually laid out a, you know, pretty good uh, speech about his $174 billion infrastructure bill. Uh, manufacturers are announcing electrification strategies. But to that point, we're still in a era that I like to call privileged mobility, where those who have access to capital have access to the latest and best technology. Um, and I want to, you know, start with this question: What are some of the most important steps that you all think that we can take to ensure that the transition to EVs is equitable and inclusive? So, I will start with Sahar. Let's kick it off with you, and I'd love to hear what your thoughts are around this. Great. And I will say opposite, Amy. I'm used to being last because of my first to last name, um, but, but great to be first. Um, I think that this, this type of work requires a multi-pronged approach. I think that there's vast agreement that electrification is incredibly important towards our climate goals in general. Um, and the transit sector has been electrifying for quite some time. We have different initiatives, uh, both at the state and federal level that require different types of electrification. Um, we have guidance that, that provides, uh, you know, opportunities and, and um, considerations for where we cite electric vehicle charging infrastructure. We have ebate programs. There's a lot out there. But as you mentioned, Terry, it's very much focused on people that have the startup capital to invest in these types of um, outcome outcome based machines, I guess, <laughs> and, and beneficial outcomes for their communities. Uh, so I think there's there's a couple things that need to happen if we really want to make this more equitable. One is I think that we need to create uh, better education materials and promotion and engagement with the communities that we're trying to target. Um, you know, there's there's a very it, this this type of uh, work is very in the weeds and um, understanding what the benefits of electrification actually are, both in terms of climate, but also in terms of community, in terms of access and congestion and air quality. Um, I think that would be really helpful for, for the vast majority of people to, to understand. And then I think we need to provide better infrastructure so that folks that are in not single family homes um, also have access to charging infrastructure at affordable rates. Uh, and then, um, provide startup capital. I mean, you know, we, we provide rebates, we provide ebates, uh, they're great. There's a lot of incentives, but again, it's, it's somewhat like buying a house. A lot of us know a mortgage is cheaper than rent, but who has a down payment to buy a big fancy house, say in the Bay Area, for example. Um, and so I think that, that uh, attacking all of those at the same time is really the only way to push us forward on a path where we're not just targeting a select group of the population. I'd also add that I think we need to expand our definition of electric vehicles to include different types of vehicles. Um, we, we often talk about this in terms of cars only, uh, but things like electrifying freight, um, electrifying bicycles, providing incentives so that folks can, can use the vehicle that makes the most sense for the trip that they need to take um, and, and allowing them to benefit from that as well. Uh, especially when people make the decision to purchase a car, it's usually for the most impactful use. Um, and so we're wasting a lot of energy and emissions on vehicles that we don't necessarily need to use all of the time. So is there ways to invest in things like car share programs, things like um, electrifying TNCs because the, the magnitude of that impact is greater than an individual owned car. So an all, all of the above approach <laughs> is, is what I'm saying, but, um, but I think really providing, focusing in on the communities that we're trying to serve rather than thinking about what makes the most sense on paper to expand the numbers. Sounds good. I wanna open the floor up for any other responses to that. We have a lot of questions to get through. I wanna make sure that we're speeding along so we can 
get to those, but if anyone else has anything that they want to add to that, I, I think that that was. Yeah, I, I, I'll chime in a little bit. I'd, I'd like to kind of share um, basically some of the highlights of what you said of, of programs that we're implementing um, that we can hopefully help um, other cities um, and utilities and communities implement some of these projects. Um, one of those is a program we have called EVs for Schools. Um, and it is a program where we um, have deployed electric vehicle charging combined with EV curriculum um, for students um, at Title I schools here in Austin. Um, we have uh, deployed this uh, curriculum. It started out in four schools and now we're in over 122 schools in Central Texas. I've been working with other cities across the U.S. to help them create their own EVs for schools, whether they have the EV charging there or if they just utilize the curriculum. But what happens in this scenario is that we're creating an educational living lab because the students are seeing their heroes, the teachers, plugging in their EVs. And a lot of our teachers here in Texas do drive EVs, especially the science teachers and their used EVs that they're into. So we're, we're looking at affordability. They come in and have workplace charging. The students are seeing them plugging in and then they're getting the curriculum and it begins to become part of the norm it's part of the culture so it's helping drive that desire that demand and also allowing people to see themselves in these vehicles um, we find the students are um, you know so excited and the high school students are saying their first car is going to be an EV after participating in these programs and we're also finding that the the conversation at the dinner table is changing it's really about culture and behavior shift and how do people see their their lives um, with transportation and how you know it, is it going to be riding any bike is it having access to um, multimodal alternative mobility and is that going to be for my community because we know that a lot of times we'll see um, we have a big e-bike initiative here in Austin we've done hundreds of e-bike demos to get people uh, hands-on, you know, training, experiencing e-bikes. We work with affordable housing to do that. Um, and what we find, though, is when they come to communities, particularly communities of color, the first thing that comes to mind um, after getting information from our focus groups and surveys is, okay, once we see an e-bike, this is really an uh, indication of gentrification. And that's really not for me. That's for someone else. So we're really trying to break down those barriers and we're trying to um, ensure that people are included in the conversation um, in, in doing in promoting programs and deploying programs. We work with community stakeholders to do that. And those are just a few things um, we can touch on um, that I can touch on that we're doing. Um, also have a lot going on with multifamily, as I mentioned, with affordable housing. Um, and then just the siting of, of the infrastructure working in collaboration with the community to ensure that we're reaching communities of color, that we're reaching our low-income communities with this infrastructure in a collaboration and providing those rebates, the deep cuts, so that they can participate in, in this new movement. Yeah, uh, all of that, I second it all. I, and, and it was really helpful. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah. Terry. <laughs> a bit of a delay here. Uh, I would just say from a macro level, I think, of course, I, I second all those comments. I do think, um, you know, it is important to recognize, I think, Sahar, you touched on this, that climate change does impact women and children the most globally and certainly underserved communities. And, you know, the transformation that's happening before our eyes is on the scale of some of the major transformations of the last century. Some of the biggest things that have happened um, industrialization, the digitalization of everything, and certainly having access to participate in this giant shift that's happening is also important. So certainly the actual you know, vehicles, charging stations, all of this is a very important part of what we should be focused on, but also making sure that people are involved in all the opportunities that are going to be generated with this entire shift and how we transport people and goods is really important as well. I literally could not agree more. Um, really, um, I'm glad that you all were able to touch on those points because it literally um, predicated, you know, some of the some of the you know, following questions that I was going to ask. But I think being able to show those examples, Amy, thank you for that, and um, just thinking through where we are. Um, the the next question that I have is, you know, we hear all of these talking points right now when we ask 
you know, the, we do a lot of research with my organization around attitudes, knowledge, and beliefs of, you know, consumers, whether they be general market diverse, et cetera. And, you know, some of the things that we see um, and find as barriers to EV adoption are access to charging and charging deserts, um, obviously education and outreach, um, as you were talking about, um, Amy, and then, you know, multifamily and for those who are not living in single family homes, what do you all think are the biggest challenges that, you know, are out there in terms of electrification? Like, if you had your brothers, what would you do or, or how would you, what challenges do you think we need to address to really expand the proverbial EV tent? I can speak from an infrastructure perspective. You know, um, we see charging as a very big challenge coming down the road here. Um, as you start to think about the number of vehicles that are transitioning to um, electrification, uh, the different types of vehicles, the amount of charging infrastructure required is going to be mind boggling. Um, you mentioned charging deserts. Certainly, rural communities um, may not have that type of access. They may have more land and may have you know, their own garages, but certainly those living in multi and rural locations may not have the type of access that those in urban settings might have. So charging infrastructure is going to certainly be one of the barriers to making sure there's equitable um, uh, inclusion of, of uh, people in this transformation. I think uh, making sure that we have pathways to actually interconnect large facilities to the grid because oftentimes if you're talking about multifamily, you're talking about urban charging solutions, it will be a larger station um, and making sure that we have ways to do that quickly uh, when people want to buy vehicles that they know that they can go ahead and have a place to charge is really important and providing ways to finance those types of solutions. Um, again, there are a lot of different programs out there, but many of them are targeted towards individual consumers. Uh, making sure that there are incentives and rebates for thinking about things at really large scale are going to be uh, one of the key solutions to making sure that we have equitable uh, transition here. One thing that we're thinking about is um, charging stations along key highway corridors, even in rural areas, that provides uh, consistent access to charging for those who are driving long distances, may not have access to multiple urban hubs. And something we believe will be required to truly uh, electrify all types of transport. Amy, so are anything that stands out or jumps out at you as being challenges that you think aren't being addressed in a way that we're going to have to deal with? Yeah, I think um, just just to follow up, I mean, I think everyone is thinking about the startup cost and, and there's a lot of legislation being proposed and ideas around that. Um, but I think to Amy's earlier point, I think the cultural shift is really important. And uh, I think it's on both sides, quite honestly. Um, you know, in terms of working with communities, I, I come from an immigrant family. My parents can afford an electric car, have a car, all they have like multiple cars, uh, but would never buy one. And, and it's because it just doesn't seem like something that makes sense to them. Um, and it's not necessarily range anxiety, which is the thing we cite often. It's just not within the context of what they would do. And I think that there's a lot of uh, in engagement that we really need to do to, to demonstrate that the benefits of electrification are actually benefits that people care about. Um, and, and our benefits that will directly impact their lives and their communities. Um, and, and again, I think expanding the definition of what we mean by electrification, making some more of those connections around, you know, vehicle electrification and land use impacts and outcomes, um, understanding uh, what, what different communities care about and where their knowledge base is. We're doing a lot of work right now where we're trying to co-create solutions with communities and uh, there's, there's a lot of, um, sort of back and forth education that needs to happen in order to do that. And then I think on the flip side, uh, I think we have to reevaluate our programs and, and what we're trying to achieve and think about, um, you know, is, are we using the right tools? Are we working with the right folks? Um, are we creating the right outcomes to the point about the, the, um, the idea that electric bikes, for example, equal gentrification? I mean, that's something we've seen for a long time. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of new forms of mobility that signal that for a lot of communities. And so how can we address that? And how can we create benefits for communities without fear of displacing them from the places where they live and, and work and play? 
Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. I think that it's critically important to engage with communities first and often and really use the knowledge and experience that is there to really be able to shape and form programs and pilots. Um, we can't, you know, we, we, it's it's been far too often and, and there's been a long history of folks parachuting in the communities, telling communities that they know what's best for them without engaging with communities and really co-creating pilots and programs and initiatives that deal with mobility in a real in a real world sense. And I too have family members that you know, the, the work that we do, it is literally that cultural shift that has to happen because, yeah, I've gotten more phone calls in the last few weeks than I have over the last decade about electric vehicles, ironically. Um, with that being said, um, you know, one of the things that we really want to think about is that, again, last week, um, you know, we have a new administration and they're doing things a different way. And we'll see how that plays itself out. Um, they have an, uh, an initiative called the Climate 40. And, you know, if you look at many of the federal agencies, they have onboarded folks whose roles are very justice centered. Um, you know, and it feels like uh, this administration is, is infusing equity into its climate programs. Do you see these initiatives as having the potential um, to have a meaningful effect? And then second part of that would be, where can the federal government have the most impact in this area? You know, I think um, just having that support at that level in these conversations, making it real, as opposed to, um, having it be a barrier and thinking that it might go away, um, that's a big deal because it's opening up a lot of opportunity for funding. Um, it's opening up a lot of opportunity for messaging. Um, and then on the local level, I mean, it, it just supports the programs that we are, are running. Um, and it, it really does, you know, it, it helps give the work credibility and it also supports science. Um, which, you know, has been something that um, has been a little bit um, controversial um, in the past four years. Um, so it's, it's something that I think um, we'll be able to take and run with if these do come into effect. I think, um, you know, the, there's programs that we need to be supporting around affordability ourselves. Um, Austin Energy, we um, just um, launched uh, 24 DC fast chargers and, and mobility hubs around the city of Austin to support those TNCs. We did that through, um, uh, you know, a, a governmental funding uh, stream. And so we know that there's more of that out there. There's a lot of money on the table, so I think it's gonna help. Um, another thing um, that I think is super important to think about when we're talking about affordability in those conversations and, and getting sort of the endorsement of governments um, is creating uh, a real world solution for people. And, you know, we're talking about money. Well, it comes down to the bottom line. One of the things that we've done at Austin Energy is we have an affordability program where we're offering um, unlimited access to our charging stations in our network. We've got over a thousand um, ports in, in and around the city of Austin, not including the DC Fast, but our level two, we have them all over. Um, available to people for $4.17 a month. They can have that unlimited access. Combine that with the messaging around what it is to drive an EV, um, which means low maintenance. There's no more oil changes. You're not going to be having those return trips uh, for maintenance that you have with, a, with an ICE vehicle. Um, so I think, you know, it really, again, just having that support, and I have been very impressed. I have sat in on some potential grant opportunities that are going to happen nationwide. And it, it really is happening. So I think it gives us an opportunity in the work that we're doing to continue. It, it, it helps uh, push our work forward. I would just add, I, I completely agree. Um, and I would just add, I, I actually used to be a Fed. And I think that thinking about the authority that 
both the agencies and the administration has. I think funding is huge, right? Providing funding, especially to places that don't have their own funding streams. I mean, I, I'm fortunate enough to live in California where we just seem to rain money sometimes. Um, but I think that there's, there's states and cities that really need some uh, collateral to make things happen um, at all, right? To build capacity and to implement projects and policies. Um, but also I think performance metrics would be really helpful uh, in terms of guidance coming from the federal government. Um, right now, a lot of programs, uh, especially around shared or neighborhood electric vehicles, um, tend to not work out because of the metrics that they're utilizing, because it, to Amy's point, the bottom line doesn't make sense for them. But if we start to look at things like community access, if we start to look at quality of life, if we start to, if we re-implement the greenhouse gas emissions um, rulemaking that almost made it <laughs> a few years back, uh, we can start to measure things that aren't necessarily just financial and start to measure the different types of public good. And that can enhance these programs as well. So I think in addition to funding and sort of authority, um, there's some work around metrics and measurement that could really be beneficial coming from the national level. Yes, without question. Um, one of the things that I think is important, um, the last several weeks we've seen, in the last several months, I would say, we've seen big announcements from OEMs and manufacturers. They're pivoting towards a full battery electric future. Um, obviously, last week, the F-150 was big news. You know, next week, there will probably be another announcement of some sort. And a few months after that, or weeks after that, there'll be another big announcement. All of that is really great, but how do we begin to think through this in with the conversations that are being had? Two things you're seeing coming out of these conversations is the need and want for more EVs, particularly from a federal level, and then diversity, equity, and inclusion, or at least equity being infused and weaved and intersecting into that how do you see that playing itself out like what do you think um what do you think needs to be done to ensure that there's going to be meaningful impact and we're not just leaving folks at the margins you know it it really has to do with um involving the community in, in um you know creating human-centered design programs um it's taking that feedback it's doing focus groups, it's doing surveys, it's it's getting into the universities, um, it, it's getting butts and seats to, to test drive vehicles. Um, you know, it really is making it a two-way conversation. It's not creating what I think is a great plan, but what the community is telling us what they want and need. Um, so it's imperative um, that we are, you know, moving forward with creating programs that involve the voice um, of the people. And we also have to go where people are. You know, that's why we need more charging in multifamily. We need to figure that figure that one out. It's a, it's a big one. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we work with um, affordable housing and we are deploying there in, in um, collaboration with our affordable housing and people want to be a part of that. Another barrier that exists is um, if someone wants to go buy an EV here in, in Texas, um, it's very difficult because the dealerships don't necessarily um, have the inventory. Uh, they don't know about EVs. And so it, there really is an education piece that needs to occur. We have um, a new website called ev.austinenergy.com. It's an EV buyer's guide that's specific to enhancing that customer EV buying experience. Um, we also have a very um, exciting piece there where we're highlighting used vehicles because it's a huge market. It really is like getting people into EVs is through that used market. And so when they go onto that website, it's real-time inventory that's there today. They show up at the dealership. They have a kiosk in the dealership that we've provided as, as a pilot that we're running right now that um, if the if there's not a sales staff on board there that knows about EVs, they can utilize this huge kiosk and find out everything that they want to know. And they can go and test drive that vehicle today, the used or new, 
and they can uh, make their own decisions. Um, is this right for me? What's in my budget? And you know, can I see myself uh, in an EV? Now, what thoughts do you have around? You're muted. Yeah. I, I figured out the mute button. Um, I, those are amazing programs that, that you all have, Amy. I think, you know, again, thinking about this maybe a bit more from a macro level, these things have to make financial sense. So as you have more OEMs, you know, the initial electric vehicles, we're really focused on the luxury market. Um, but when you have commitments from manufacturers that their entire vehicle lineup will be electric, um, I think that provides opportunities for others um, they don't just see it as, you know, this California luxury thing. They realize that there's all kinds of vehicles for all kinds of folks and all kinds of uses um, that will be electric. So I think that's going to be a key component. How do you increase affordability at its root? Um, obviously, incentives are key um, and will be uh, very important as this, um, you know, happens uh, to start to transition at scale. But I do think um, affordability is definitely one of the pieces that I think is important here both on the vehicle side, but also I keep talking about charging, maybe it's because where I'm focused, but on the charging side as well, people need to know that they will have a long-term access to uh, affordable charging. And so thinking about all of those pieces in tandem are really important to think about mass adoption, um, which will you know, be a big part of equity in this rollout. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, I, I absolutely see all of that. The, the second part of that question, or the, the next part of that question is, we recently worked on a number of pieces of federal legislation to accentuate this. And so one was EVs for Underserved Communities Act, the other, um, well, there were several others that are being refined currently. But the idea is, is that I'd like to know from a, from a policy vantage point, what do you all think um, should be done to help accelerate EV adoption in those under-resourced, underrepresented communities that could easily fall to the margins. You know, we talk about financing, we talk about access to affordable EVs. From a policy level, what do you all think would be good policy measures to really increase EV adoption? Sahar, so, since you were a Fed before, I'm gonna start with you. Yeah, no problem. Um, I mean, I think, it, it follows along the same lines of what we've been talking about. I think that uh, increasing engagement with communities, unfortunately, that is a longer term process, right? But um, I think that's an incredibly important one right now. There's no real requirement. It's just good practice and it's not done often. Um, but if there's ways to enhance the requirement around the engagement and the community input into the, the selection of projects and locations for uh, siting electric vehicles and whether they're given to fleets or, you know, just things like that. I think that engaging the community is a really important piece of it. Um, I also think that having uh, broader programs for electrification incentives and not just rebates, but greater incentives, some of the legislation you were discussing, but also marrying it with land use. Um, you know, ensuring that housing and new development has uh, charging infrastructure or shared charging vehicles or e-bikes or whatever it may be that makes sense for the specific typology of where it is. Um, and then including that in those programs. There's a program uh, out here in California, it was piloted in Sonoma County where they actually did uh, use um, localized funding to assist in um, purchasing used vehicles specifically for fleet operators. And so they provided, uh, I can't remember the exact numbers, I apologize, but it was a, a, a substantial portion of subsidy for folks that were driving for fleets um, and wanted to purchase used electric vehicles. And they found that the outcomes of that were quite beneficial because you're first of all, making it more affordable for people that maybe aren't buying new cars, which a lot of people are not buying new cars. Um, and secondly, you're, you're magnifying the impact of that electrification through the vehicle miles traveled of a fleet vehicle versus a personal vehicle. Um, so just thinking about policies around programs that might promote the best outcomes 
um, and really making sure to include the community when we design those. Uh, because I think, again, we're just so used to making things that we think are good for people and then taking it to them as opposed to working with people and figuring out what they actually need um, and then creating co-creating outcomes together. Yeah, uh, a quick data point last year, 41 million used vehicles were so uh, <laughs> converse to 17 million new vehicles. So the idea is we really have to begin to think about how we approach the pre-owned market. And particularly with pre-owned vehicles comes, if, if folks are like folks in my family, there is this 100 years of habit with fossil fuel that predicate folks to think, wow, I don't know if I want to buy uh, X number of year old vehicle because it may come with all of these problems. And with some of the entry level EVs, I get it. But as we begin to get more and more EVs on the market, hopefully folks will have a different perspective on that. But does anyone else have any policy recommendations that they think can be utilized to really accelerate um, EV adoption? One of the topics that's come up quite a bit um, here in the city of Austin, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on um, in, in your states and, and cities, but I imagine this topic is happening if it's not already being mandated, but we're looking at ways to uh, ensure policy-wise that um, properties, um, places of business are at least EV ready, especially in anything that's uh, new build. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that this is a really important step. And so we do have some incentive-based um, Green Star building things that that organizations can achieve by by doing this. Um, but I think it'll be interesting to see um, just you know in in hopefully the the coming years um, very soon that that this will be more of a normal thing. Is just making sure that where people are living and working um, that the charging is there, whether it either or at least. EV readiness is being uh, uh, conducted. That's question. My plug for infrastructure, but I really believe that, you know, the electric grid is going to have to change substantially to accommodate all of these electric vehicles. Um, an estimate I've seen is that the amount of generation required to uh, fully transform our system would be twice of what we have online today. So that's a lot of generation capacity, that's a lot of transmission distribution, and it's pretty dry and boring, but to ensure that we are able to really uh, electrify everything we want to, we're gonna need a lot more electricity and a lot more um, wires to transmit that. So policy around that and the administration is starting to address that a little bit, but there's a whole aspect of the energy system that needs to be upgraded um, in anticipation. And thinking about equity, you know, that might be an area where some of those areas could be focused on first, um, where we want to actually increase large scale charging. Uh, and that's definitely an area of policy that I think um, is starting to get more traction, but people aren't quite as focused on. It's been a lot of focus on the vehicles, but the infrastructure really required is significant and we're behind. Um, if, if the vehicles are starting to get delivered today, um, there's, you know, 5X delivered next year and, and 20X two years from now. And the amount of infrastructure is not, is not there yet. And yeah. I, I'm sorry, sorry, I just want to add one thing on, on the infrastructure note and, and sort of the adoption of EVs. I think we also just really need to focus on the outcomes we're trying to achieve around EVs. Ultimately, we're trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, right? And so a one-for-one -one trade of personal vehicles for personal EVs is not going to be the best outcome that we can get. Um, so I think, again, thinking about uh, fleets of vehicles, thinking about different types of vehicles like e-bikes, thinking about transit and freight electrification is going to be really essential to this conversation as well. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't agree more with that. This ecosystem of mobility, it's so important. And looking at our transit um, to ensure that our buses are electric, that's going to be huge if we do, can do that across the country. We're working on it right now here in Austin. We will no longer have new buses purchased that are not electric. Um, and, I, and I do think that, um, you know, cities should be leading by example. Uh, the city fleet uh, needs to be electric. We are in the process of transitioning um, to 330 electric vehicle fleets. We've got about a, um, 
180 on the street now. Um, and I just think that that is, you know, a great place to start. You have public transit, you have the city fleet, um, and then you can rely on some outreach um, around the multimodal um, electric bikes and, and other um, alternative mobility. So, so uh, that's a really good point. So I'm, I'm reading the questions that have been submitted by folks who are participating. One is really um, interesting to me, and I want to get you all's input on this. And we've seen over the past few years um, a few things that have happened around EV registration fees. And EV registration fees, particularly um, on those communities who are underrepresented and underserved, can potentially be a barrier to EV adoption if you're looking at light duty personal vehicles. Um, I'd love to hear you all weigh in on that because the opposition, um, the, you know, the converse conversation around it is, is that if we're gonna have more EVs on the road, that's less gas tax that's generated, less upkeep and maintenance of our freeway and road system. I have my thoughts, but I'd love to hear you all's. I'm happy to get us started. I have a lot of thoughts on this. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> I mean, I think that when we talk about, uh, you know, first of all, the gas tax as it is, is something that's funded by essentially doesn't totally work and um, and and uh, often those things are paid for by sales tax and local sales tax revenues. Um, and so everyone's paying into a system that's being used. Um, I do think that in California in particular, we tag a lot of things onto registration fees to try and make money um, for things that we need to pay for, right? And, and in theory, it makes sense, but ultimately it's almost a regressive tax for lower income communities and lower income families. Um, so I think that there's ways to scale that and there's ways to create programs so that you know if you meet certain income thresholds or you meet certain requirements then that um, cost is less uh, or or removed entirely i mean we see it all the time in fines we see it all the time in other types of programs there's no reason we can't do it with legislation for registration fees as well um, but I will say overall on the funding of the system, uh, you know, as there's as there's a movement towards electrification, there is a lot of concern around the revenue that's generated for the maintenance and upkeep of our roads and highways. Um, I would say, first of all, it'd be great if we focused on maintenance and upkeep instead of continued expansion uh, of roads constantly. Um, but secondly, I think there's a lot of uh, examination of things like road usage charging um, and really paying for what we're using uh, on the roads. And and there's a lot of states and a lot of different cities kind of examining both that and congestion pricing. Um, and so I think we really need to start to look at new models of paying for the maintenance of our roads. Um, but again, also focusing on the maintenance of our roads, <laughs> not expansion. Mm -hmm. Neha, anything on this? You know, I know that we're about out of time and I, you know, I just wanted to mention one thing that we have and if you don't mind if I kind of shift a little bit, um, I just sure. wanted to talk a little bit about our ultimate goal here um, uh, and what we're trying to achieve. And and yes, it's it's to reduce emissions, but it's also upward mobility for people. It's lifting people from poverty. And so that's access to emerging technology, especially around transportation. Transportation is the number two household expense across the US. I know it is for sure here in Austin. So I think these things are really intertwined and we're talking about environmental justice and social justice all kind of combined that, that intersection there. So I just want to, um, kind of focus on that in this work just because it is hand in hand one cannot work without the other if we're not providing access uh, to um, this uh, technology to everyone then we're not really going to see the movement it, it's just not going to happen I, I couldn't agree more i think that as we begin to wrap up there's a triple bottom line opportunity for us we can actually address transportation burden obviously that is something that plays communities we can address public health because we know that those in, those communities that are impacted first and worst um, typically skew in a few communities. And then we can actually change the vertical or economic trajectory of those communities as well. And so being able to intersect all of those things into a program 
um, moving forward, uh, really, I think, could be beneficial to a number of uh, m more than one reason to, to go electric. So, you know, it looks like we are literally out of time, but this has been really fun. Um, thank you all, uh, panelists, for providing your insight into this. Thank you, attendees, for uh, providing your comments and questions in the chat. Um, and thank you all for being here. And we'll be back, I'm sure, at another time, continuing this conversation and hopefully accelerating and expanding the tent so that more people will benefit from transportation electrification. Terry, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Everybody. Mm -hmm. Did we just leave now? What do we do? Bye, Terry. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you as well, Amy. We got to catch up soon. Absolutely.